Dr. Shimali Alam will be our next speaker. Dr. Alam is a pediatric urologist that specializes in urinary tract reconstruction and the management of patients with neurogenic bladder and congenital anomalies of the kidney and urinary tract. He has a referral practice for complex urology and sees patients from around the country and internationally at the Medical University of South Carolina. Dr. Alam has lectured and operated in multiple countries and has performed several hundred urinary tract reconstructions over the last 15 years. Together with his program manager, Lisa Creelman, they helped create a reconstructive center and team at MUS. To date has performed 36 urinary tract reconstructions and cared for several hundred patients with neurogenic bladder making this program one of the busiest complex urologic programs in the nation. To learn more about the program or to obtain a chart review or a second opinion, you can contact Dr. Alam and Lisa at creelman at musc.edu or alams at musc.edu. Just as a reminder, there will be time for questions and answers after each session. Please type your questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we will try to get to them all. Um, I just uh, want to thank everyone for uh, allowing the opportunity to talk. It's, uh, it's really nice to address an audience in this manner. It beats sort of getting on a plane and, and, and traveling, as is usually the case. So I uh, hope everyone's comfortable, and we can kind of get our conversation started. Uh, the talk is going to be mainly uh, conversational style. So uh, as the uh, technology allows, we can always break for questions. And if there's a slide or something that's a little bit confusing, just let me know. But today we're going to talk about the management of the bowel and bladder across the lifespan. And again, this is more conversational style. I was really sort of intrigued by the pictures that I was watching over the course of the last few minutes as I was waiting for this talk, because it sort of exemplified the freedom that we are all trying to get for our patients. And uh, that's pretty much sums up in a nutshell what it is that we're trying to do in terms of management of bowel and bladder. This is really not about you know, a specific organ. This is more about freedom and about the ability to live the life that you know, everyone deserves to live. And so as we move on, uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge Lisa Creelman, who's been my program manager and has been with me now through three different institutions. Started out together in Cincinnati uh, back in 2005 when I was just a fellow and then she followed me to New York where we built a program at Columbia and then now to MUSC. Uh, Megan's our social worker and Kate's our a dietitian and the hospital administration has been grateful enough, gracious enough to allow us a, a team uh, for building a complex center. They, they bought into the idea, they believed it and in the last couple of years we've really been able to build something that I'm, that I'm quite proud of. So what is it that we do? It's, it's not just spina bifida or myelomeningocele, it's really all bladder disorders and it spans a lot of different diagnoses. And as you can see, um, spinal dysraphisms like myelomeningocele, tethered cord, lipomeningocele, spinal cord injury are part of a huge uh, group of patients that we do see. The main focus in the areas that I got interested in when I first started when I was a young resident was in fact the kidney. And the congenital anomalies of the kidney and urinary tract are really intriguing to me. And neurogenic bowel and bladder, believe it or not, have a lot to do with patients with CACIT. And it's really hard to see a patient and say, well, we're only going to take care of patients with spina bifida or we're only going to take care of patients with neurogenic bladder. I think one has to understand that we just take care of patients. And um, some patients have different bowel and bladder needs, and sometimes those needs can affect the kidneys, which can affect uh, long-term health and uh, growth and development. Chronic kidney disease is a really big problem in children. Um, in the 1950s and 60s, myelomeningocele was a significant cause of chronic kidney disease in children. We were very, very lucky with the advent of intermittent catheterization, um, sort of uh, desc described by Jack Lapides in the 1970s, and chronic kidney disease really became less of an issue in industrialized nations in children with myelomeningocele. But as you can see here, chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease in children is still about 50% related to CACIT. And in those patient populations, there are still, unfortunately, patients with spinal dysraphisms. I've transplanted a number of adults with myelomeningocele and lipomeningocele and spinal dysraphism. So as far as we've come in the industrialized world, we have still a ways to go. 
The unfortunate thing that people don't tend to understand is that it's a cyclical process. The chronic kidney disease is progressive. You can go from stage one to stage five to end stage. But after transplant, you can actually go right back into stage two, three, four, and five. And a lot of that has to do with the fate of the bladder, which we're going to discuss. Again, the theme of this talk is the bladder and bowel across time. And this is what I really want to get home and drive into the audience is that the bladder can cause more problems than you think, and you can't see these problems. And unfortunately, sometimes these problems come over decades. And decisions we make when children are four and six have significant repercussions when they're 30 and 40. So what is at stake? Well, you know, I've always wanted to talk about what the cost of one nephron is. A nephron is like one of the sort of cells, um, if you will, that occupy the kidney and are, result and are responsible for the filtration. We go through them in patients with neurogenic bladder who are managed in different manners when they have, or they have high pressure or no one has been kind of following the kidneys. And unfortunately, the management of neurogenic bladder is sometimes just taking one disease and trading it for another. For example, an augmentation or starting catheterization or doing a diversion, but it's the best thing we have. Now, the most important thing for everyone to understand is that watchful waiting or this concept where, oh, when we, we're gonna cath your child when, when they want to be cath, when they wanna get out of diapers, that actually may cause more harm than you think. And it's a really hard concept to get around, but watchful waiting actually may be active harm for the future. And sometimes what happens is there's a, a little bit of a disconnect with the pediatric providers and the patients with um, neurogenic bladder. And we want to wait and we want to wait and we want to wait. And sometimes we just, in, just by default, create a group of adult patients with these problems and that they haven't been managed when they're children. And sometimes the best way to manage them is when they're children and the most effective way is when they're children. So the stakeholders are, are vast. It's not just pediatric urology, our nephrology colleagues, our neurosurgical colleagues, our surgical colleagues, the, the children with neurogenic bladder and bowel span um, really across the board in terms of everyone really has a role in management and sort of helping the, with the health of the child long-term. The cost of failure is too much to talk about. That's the problem here. I advocate this sort of idea of early management of the bowel and bladder because there is a significant economic cost uh, to not doing so. There's a cost to the system as a whole. There's a cost to the family. Outcomes may be diminished by waiting longer than um, people think, and morbidity can be acquired. And that's a big issue here. We're not talking necessarily about mortality. I think mortality data is a separate conversation, but morbidity data, meaning the fact that patients may have ulcers who have bowel and bladder issues that are not under control. Those ulcers may not heal secondary or in part because of the bowel and bladder issues. Most importantly, and this is something that I take very seriously, this whole idea of urinary tract reconstruction and management of the bladder and bowel is really not a solo sport. It used to be in the 1970s and 80s that the surgeon was sort of the center of the universe and all the other subspecialists and pediatricians sort of rotated around the, universe, uh, around the surgeon's universe, but that's not the case anymore. The patient is really at the center and we all play supporting roles to try and help the patient obtain the life that they deserve to live. And I would add that all of our supporting roles are equally important. The goals obviously are a full life and you can't have a full life without taking into to context everything. It's not just kidney health, it's not just continence, it's not being dry, it's not being out of diapers. This is about growth and development. This is about future sexual concerns. This is about nutrition and also about continence. So what is a normal bladder? Well, this is a really difficult concept for people to understand. A normal bladder is basically a large low pressure bladder, which is under control day and night. The size in the first year of life or the first two year of life is probably about seven mLs per kilogram. So a 10 pound baby around four kilograms should have a bladder capacity of about four times seven, which is about 28 or 30 mLs or one ounce. And sometimes you'll see those babies have bladder capacities of 60 or 70 mLs or two ounces, two and a half ounces. That can, help, can cause damage in the long term. Afterwards, the, cal the calculation is actually quite straightforward. And one thing for, for people to understand is normal babies, normal infants without any spinal dysraphisms, void every hour with high pressures. So I tend to push your dynamics um, until about a year of life because they're kind of uninterpretable unless there are changes on the ultrasound that sort of dictate or validate the need to do urodynamics. An abnormal bladder, and this is where people get confused, 
A neurogenic bladder is simply defined as a bladder that can't empty or store. It actually has no part of the definition is related to the nerves. And continence, meaning the ability to stay dry or the ability to take, take urine and get out of your bladder is actually not a measure of a healthy bladder. So every time you go to the office and the doctor says, is your child urinating? Can you see a stream? Are they emptying their bladder? Those are actually not validated issues or validated questions that will tell you that the patient's healthy. They're just things. And voiding may be possible, but actually in some cases, the act of voiding, passing urine out of the urethra, can be really harmful in the patient with neurogenic bladder. So some myths or facts, um, again, voiding. People think that that means things are great. Oh, my child can feel, my child can empty their bladder, my child has a strong stream. None of those have any bearing on the health of that bladder or the child for the future. Emptying the bladder. Emptying the bladder is only really pertinent for older adults, typically with diabetes. If they don't empty their bladder, they get urinary tract infections. Children who empty their bladder aren't necessarily healthier than children who don't. Uh, having no urinary tract infections is not necessarily a sign of health. Matter of fact, some of my sickest kids, the ones who are in kidney failure, never have UTIs. And being dry is actually not um, a sign of health either. So these are things to understand as you go to the doctor and they ask you over and over again these things. They're just things. They don't mean things are necessarily good, nor do they mean things are bad. Well, well let's talk about an example. So here's a child who was voiding. If you see here in the corner, the bladder is a little bit trabeculated. Um, so I hope everyone can see my mouse. The arrow points to some thickening of the bladder wall and the ureter is a little dilated. This is just a standard grayscale ultrasound. The child was voiding and over time they started voiding with high pressures, developed reflux and actually blew out the prostatic urethra. So again, in the future now, uh, sexual um, health is in jeopardy. And when we started plotting the kidney, we showed that the kidney wasn't growing, the kidney that was refluxing wasn't growing. And in fact, when we did a renal scan of the kidney, the child basically lost kidney function on the right-hand side. They were continent and they were voiding and they didn't have infections. But now for the future, they will in all likelihood have serious, sex, serious sexual concerns and have lost about 20% of the overall kidney function on the right-hand side. And the scarring of the kidney will increase their risk of high blood pressure for the future. So again, an example of a child who was voiding and dry with a neurogenic bladder, but those things didn't necessarily mean they were healthy. So the kidneys are really a barometer of health of the bladder and pressure hurts kidneys. So when you look at a child with neurogenic bladder, even through the years, ultrasounds and kidney function measurements are really the only way to understand if the bladder is having problems. And pressure can be there in the setting of storing urine or actually when voiding. So here's just an illustrative case, which is one of the sadder cases I've taken care of in my career. This is a child who was born with a tethered cord and what's called a cloaca. Uh, they were born on the West Coast. They had some things done and they were sent to us because even though the testing at birth was normal, they started getting very, very sick. So we ended up repairing the cloaca when the child was about 18 months of age. The ultrasound showed massive hydronephrosis beforehand and massive reflux. So post-operatively, everything went away. And the reason it went away wasn't because we did a great surgery, is because I started the child on intermittent catheterization. And so just with intermittent catheterization, both the hydronephrosis and the reflux went away. No surgery for the bladder. So things got really better. We were really happy. The child went back to their home um, on the West Coast. The kidney function was very diminished, but unfortunately, this morbidity was acquired. But at three years of age, I was very hopeful that they would get kidney function back. Unfortunately, they were seen by another uh, physician. They did a urodynamics and they said, oh my goodness, she can pee. Let's stop caffeine. She has had, got a good stream. She has an ability to generate contractions. Well, it took about eight months. The reflux came back. She had multiple urinary tract infections. The parents then were saying, oh, my child can pee. We're not gonna start caps again. And uh, she ended up having a vesicostomy performed because she went to end stage and she's on renal, in renal failure. And the last I heard, she was on the transplant list. Um, I don't know what happened to her. They obviously stopped following, but 
the last I heard, they were taken away from the parent. The child was taken away from the parents as well. So it's just a sad state for people to understand that this whole concept of peeing and a good stream or feeling or emptying the bladder doesn't necessarily mean that a neurogenic bladder patient has a healthy bladder or kidneys. So these elevated voiding pressures is something that people don't understand or talk about because of all the urodynamics were, you know, sort of based on tests that were done in the 1980s, 81 specifically, where they looked at just storage conditions of the bladder. Voiding is actually very important as well. So basically we intervene and we do things like intermittent catheterization or vesicostomies or diversions and manage the bladder aggressively because we wanna try and avoid chronic kidney disease. And in the United States and in, you know, in the first world countries, even in third world countries, it's really not an acceptable outcome from spina bifida to have kidney disease. So in order to understand kidney disease, you have to stage it. And so many people will say, oh, things look good. The, the labs are good. Your, your child is fine. Kidneys are normal. But they don't get specific measurements of GFR. And in all, everyone on this panel and everyone in the, in the audience should understand that they should always know what their child's GFR is. And they should know what their own GFR is if some of you guys are the patients. And the GFR can be staged here. The best way to get it is for testing. Now, some people say, oh, there's multiple ways to manage patients. We, the problem with that is that there are, but if we individualize our management based on just beliefs and biases, there's no demonstrable outcomes we can measure. And we'll never know if we're making a difference. So I try and standardize everything, not to over-treat or under-treat, but just to get enough data so that we can make some changes for the future. We try to have consistent treatment algorithms. We try and reduce all variation. We try to provide support for our families. It's always a multidisciplinary team caring for our families, and there's always coordination of care in order to make that work. So just another case so you guys understand, because many people out there will see a pediatric urologist, they'll have reflux and neurogenic bladder, and the first thing is they talk about surgery. Where well, here's a child who had reflux and an rectal malformation and only had one kidney. So he also had a tethered cord, or actually he had a lipomeningocele. After we repaired him, we put the suprapubic tube in and I started intermittent catheterization and the reflux went away. And this was back when he was about 18 months of age. Now, I've been following for years. We've been doing urodynamics, you know, once every couple of years. We've had some bumps in the road, but he's doing quite well. He ended up with a metrophen off and a Malone. And over the summer before I left New York City, he invited me to go see Radiohead, which is my favorite band. He heard one day that most of my kids are reconstructed with Radiohead in the background. And so he thought it'd be a good idea to take me. And so this is just a point to show that we take care of our kids for as long as they let us. I see children into adulthood as I'm getting older, that becomes more and more common. But in this particular instance, we have a child who basically had bladder surgery avoided. He did a metrophen off and a Malone because they really wanted one for his enemas and for his bladder management. But his reflux is gone, his kidney function is normal, and he's doing well and thriving. So the take-home message, again, long-term thinking about the bladder. In children with neurogenic bladder, reflux does not always have to be surgically managed. And in fact, when you manage it surgically, you may hurt the kidneys and you may hurt the bladder. So in these cases, uh, most patients respond well to intermittent catheterization because not all reflux needs to be reimplanted. Now, infants are even in that same category. This is an infant who had a VCUG which showed massive reflux. And one year later with just intermittent catheterization and oxybutynin, and the reflux was gone and the kidney function was completely normal. We have a question. So for a spina bifida, in patients spina bifida, we do a GFR every year. And the way we do the GFR is something with a, with a, something called a cystatin C. And I'm going to write that down now. And that's a lab. And the cost of that lab is literally about, uh, I think it's $120. And most labs can do it. And it's a really good way to validate the GFR. So again, here's the GFR in infancy. This is very important for people to understand because some patients with myelomeningocele are born with very, very unstable bladders. And they can have kidney injury. But if you see here, over the course of the first year of life, the GFR can almost triple. So if you manage those patients aggressively, those with kidney injury who are one day old, there's a chance that they may have normal kidney function by the time they're a year of age. And in fact, uh, I used to transplant uh, probably three to five infants a year, um, kidney transplant. And uh, those numbers have dro dropped down dramatically now with early aggressive management of the bladder in children. 
So the question sometimes people will say is, should they just be in diapers, should they leak, or should we cath or not cath? But the problem is, these aren't the questions that we need to ask. Leaking does not mean a healthy bladder. Being in diapers does not mean a healthy bladder. Emptying your bladder does not mean a healthy bladder. And surgery, even though it's scary for a lot of patients, is not elective. It is sometimes necessary in order to protect the kidneys. And again, watchful waiting can sometimes be active harm. Now, catheterization does not represent failure of bladder management. Catheterization is sometimes a way of life. If your child had diabetes, you would never, bl you wouldn't blink an eye at the idea of giving uh, insulin. However, um, sometimes people do have this sort of resistance for catheterization. So here's an example of how I think the system failed one of my kids. And this is a 19 year old patient with spina bifida who came to see me and they were leaking. The bladder was exceedingly thick on VCUG. The bladder had multiple diverticulum. It was just basically an end stage bladder. He was 19, profoundly affected in a wheelchair. And um, the mom was saying, what can we do? Over the course of his life, he'd been admitted multiple times for urinary tract infections and sepsis. He had some cognitive impairment and his mother was getting older. She couldn't carry him around. She couldn't do things. His bowels were unmanaged. There was no plan for the future. And this poor child was 19 years old. The opportunity to intervene was when he was one or two. And now this mother is dealing with the child and unfortunately hasn't been, there's been no intervention and, and there's been some problems. And, you know, I think we actually failed this child as a system. And this is what I'm trying to avoid. So again, going back to our goals, this is something that I really, really want to hit home on is that we're trying to make a full life for our kids. So if we wear blinders and we just look at the bladder, we're going to lose the patients are gonna lose because the colon and a poorly managed colon will hamper the best successful management of the bowels, or the bladder, excuse me. So we must aggressively treat constipation and bowel management because it can impart a risk of an inf infection. It can impart a risk of incontinence of the urinary tract, believe it or not, as well as problems with catheterization. Just to illustrate the case, here's a child who had um, with anorectal malformation and a lipomeningocele. He was uh, born with one kidney. Uh, he was missing one of his legs and uh, he was reconstructed. And after his successful urinary tract reconstruction, he had multiple infections and presented with significant hydronephrosis of his kidney. When we did an x-ray, his, basically his x-ray was from here to here, just full of stool. And he was on Miralax and the mom was wondering, you know, every time I put him on Miralax, he has diarrhea, so he's not constipated. Well, he was impacted. Uh, Miralax doesn't really work in patients with neurogenic bowel. That includes the spina bifida or spinal trapezoid and cohorts. It's an osmotic. It basically increases the water content of stool. And unfortunately, neurogenic bowel and bladder, uh, the, the action of the colon is the peristalsis is missing. So you can't just make stool more liquidy and expect it to work. It's really not appropriate, and in that case, it caused quite a bit of harm. So we ended up taking him to the OR. We made him alone, and his hydronephrosis went away. So there's a very, very good example of how constipation or poorly managed uh, colon can actually cause renal injury. And there's really uh, no greater example that I can think of than to show how you have massive swelling of the kidney, you manage the bowel, and the swelling goes away. So the bowel and bladder are intimately related. So again, large stool loads may increase infections, may um, change the way the bladder is, uh, uh, grows and develops. It can mimic or provoke um, changes on urodynamics, which then people get excited about and do things without managing the root cause, which is the bowels. It can lead to overtreatment. Shunt complications can happen because of significant um, constipation and can cause calf issues. Um, we are going to get to that question later. Uh, I just want to make sure that gets saved. So um, in the background here is pr really prior to the work of Hardy Hendren in the 1970s, most of our patients with spina bifida were sort of destined to life in diapers or life with stomas. Uh, life was short, uh, usually truncated by progressive renal failure or worse and uh, significant marginalization in society occurred with our patients. Um, 
we've changed that over the years. The, the collective we, not not that I had anything to do with this, but the collective we, the, sur the surgeons, the physicians, uh, the, the teams have really made an effort to improve care. And what we do at NUSC with our center is we offer prenatal counseling, counseling of course, we um, select birth centers, we help the patients understand what will happen to their children after delivery. Uh, we do offer a significant medical management arm. Not all of this is about surgery. We look at the bladder, the bowels, nutrition, we look at renal health, we look at genital and sexual health. Um, part of our process is surgical management, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that in a second. And the majority of what I do is actually reoperative surgery. Um, over the years, for better or for worse, I've been known as the person to go to when you've had an operation that uh, didn't reach the outcome that you expected. Our bladder management protocols are mainly intermittent catheterization. And uh, the when, the who, and the why are really individualized for the patient. We do tend to use anticholinergics. Um, over the 15 years of my practice, the only anticholinergics I use are oxybutynin. Uh, we've tried Detrol, Desicare, all of those things, and none of them tend to work the same way that oxybutynin does. I have no stock in oxybutynin. Oxybutynin is now a generic, but it is really the only thing that has efficacy in patients with neurogenic bladder, unfortunately. Uh, catheterization, I tend to start all my infants on catheterization with a six French catheter, rapidly going up to eight French. Uh, we never use a feeding tube because they're long, it takes a while for them to drain, and believe it or not, they can cause more injury and cause more infection. This is a resource intense issue. We provide as much family support as we can. Lisa Krillman, my program manager, has been instrumental at that. And Megan, our social worker, has really helped families as much as she can. But we have nurses to teach catheterization. We help families with their management of supplies. The durable medical equipment companies are a disaster, require multiple phone calls and faxes and things of that nature. Uh, multiple phone calls to the families. Families are always calling us to address problems. And we try and partner with the families and partner with the pediatricians to help uh, for the long term. So uh, Botox, uh, I, I didn't talk about Botox for a reason because uh, I have never used it with success and the majority of patients I've seen who've had Botox, I have had to do reconstructions on. Botox tends to work for a short period of time and then it stops working, just so you guys understand. Uh, Botox has a, a significant role financially. It does uh, make revenue. And I think that drives the majority of the Botox injections. Um, they do not work long-term. Let's see here. Uh, the other question. Uh, so the catheters or the age, let's go here. Sorry, my clicking is a little slow here, so I apologize. So your eight to zero to 12 months is typically eight French, one to eight years of age, 10 French, and greater than eight years are used 12 French catheters. These are, I typically use um, coloplast or barred clear uh, silicone catheters. Cure catheters are also fine. I do not like Robinell's. I do not like latex catheters. I do not like opaque catheters because the sense of emptying is a little bit better when the catheter is clear. So uh, urinary tract infections, this is actually another very big issue. Uh, people who cath will have a chance of a positive culture almost 70% of the time. And this is data which was done from rehab okay. hospitals. And um, random cultures typically result in overtreatment and the development of antibiotic resistance and allergies. So we tend to be very careful and cautious with, um, with, uh, with uh, antibiotics. Symptoms of UTI, we tend to only treat urine tract infections if there's pain with catheterization, if there's a change, there's new onset leaking, blood in the urine, difficulty with caths, or unexplained high fevers in the setting of positive culture. I tend to treat more virulent organisms like Proteus, Pseudomonas, Klebsiella, Enterococcus, pan-sensitive E. coli, I tend not to treat, sometimes MDR E. coli or multidrug resistant E. coli. I have a patient right now in Florida, which I've been sort of watching the last couple of days, and he's doing fine without treatment. We're pushing fluids. Um, this whole concept of colonization is a little bit over, um, overused. Patients will have um, bacteria that grow in their bladder, but oftentimes they will clear it, provided the caffeine is going well. There's no foreign body, there's no stones, and there's no uh, resistance to emptying when they cath. Sometimes you have to look at the cause of the UTI. 
The UTI can be caused simply by uh, constipation, uh, poor cath habits, or inadequate caths. Um, sometimes people cath every six hours. That's really not consistent with catheterization. We tend to cath every three to four hours. Sometimes people are using smaller catheters and they're not completely emptying the bladder. Uh, again, a note on catheterization. Some people say, well, I can cath every six or eight hours because my bladder can hold that much. Well, whenever you insert a catheter in, you're also inserting bacteria in, and urine happens to be a great media for bacteria, and caffeine frequently helps to decrease the chance of that urine growing bacteria that will turn into a urinary tract infection. So what's at stake? We really have to treat our patients in a holistic manner. Interventions, all of our interventions have consequences, whether we start caffeine, whether we start enemas, whether we start something. The surgeries we do and the interventions we make must last for decades. You should ask your surgeon or you should ask your doctor, so what happens What in your practice when you say this and you give this advice? What do you see in the 40-year-olds? What do you see in the 50-year-olds? They should be able to answer that. Um, they should know. Uh, a lot of pediatricians and pediatric surgeons and pediatric urologists wear blinders and, and patients leave at 18, and we don't really know what the consequences of our advice are. So follow-up and a plan for transition is imperative for success. So care coordination is something that we feel very strongly about. And um, basically, there's the definition, but basically it's about really communicating amongst different care providers and patients and family members about really what the best way is to treat the families. There are many barriers to care coordination. Uh, the electronic medical record has made it easier for us to bill and, and, and justify our billing, but it really hasn't made it easier to take care of patients, nor has it made it easier to integrate patients who seek, seek care in different institutions. The letters we send aren't really letters. Sometimes they're a lot of fluff, and uh, it's more about billing compliance. But there are some benefits of the EMR because we can actually now um, have documentation that's not handwritten and sometimes physicians and handwriting is hard to read and sometimes there's some opportunity for teaching okay let me just see there's one more question here um so uh vesicare uh my vetric uh really none of those medications uh help with neurogenic bladder uh just so you guys understand how all these drugs came to market so uh vesicare my vetric uh detrol uh Toviaz, uh, they paid physicians to recruit patients, to put them into studies, to see if the medication worked. Uh, many patients that were recruited, especially with the Vesicare and Myrovetric, because I actually turned down those studies, were patients who were non-neurogenic bladders, meaning uh, ambulatory patients without any spinal dysraphisms that had voiding dysfunction. And uh, underlying constipation was not necessarily treated. None of the uh, variables were necessarily uh, treated and managed. And that's how all these drugs got to market. These were paid studies. They were not actually, um, uh, uh, what, what I call it? They were not actually uh, randomized trials. Now let's see here. Uh, if intermittent catheterization is every three hours and bowel management uh, doesn't stop urine leaks, is it uh, possible to be dry without surgical intervention? Uh, so that's Pandora's box there. And those are patients who typically need uh, urodynamics with the urethral pressure profilimetry to understand that. Okay. Um, again, Botox, we sort of went over that. Uh, Botox, again, has some long-term uh, side effects, the mainly one that doesn't work forever. Insurances continue to be an issue. Uh, providers differ. There's multiple DME exclusions for patients. Uh, United Healthcare, for example, is a great insurance company. A lot of large uh, employers use it, but sometimes United Healthcare plans have a DME exclusion. All things you guys really need to be educated about and know about. ED visits may remain an issue, transportation issues. Uh, there's wheelchair access issues. In New York City, it was very frustrating for my kids in wheelchairs. And um, at the end of this, everyone understands that children are the greatest risk of being cared for improperly or not being cared for very well, but they don't vote. So they don't have a say. And uh, this is all about advocacy for our children. Uh, medical management is something we take very seriously. Uh, we typically get multiple second, third, fourth, fifth, 19th opinions. Uh, I do them uh, electronically. We do them uh, via telehealth. We do them in multiple ways. I've done them my entire life and Lisa helps coordinate with that. So our follow-up plans and protocols are really put in place. We follow our children really for life. 
Um, and we have minimal transition plans. We have multiple referral networks that we utilize. And just there is a map of all the kids that we have seen thus far in South Carolina the last two years in blue. Um, I think I actually have a Colorado patient that came a few uh, months ago. So we're, we're pretty much closing the map. So let me see some questions here real quickly. I think we're gonna be running out of time soon. Um, so MACE versus Paracine for bowel management. Here's an example. This is a child who was on um, Malone flush, excuse me, was on uh, enema flushes for a while. And we did a Malone, she did very well. Uh, mom emails, they give us the recipe. We change the recipe and they're fine. These are emails that we get multiple times a day, sometimes several times a day, sometimes great emails, sometimes kind of, uh, you know, emails looking for help. This is part of the care coordination. Paristine, uh, if you live in South Carolina, it's fantastic because it's paid for. Uh, in New York, it's in relatively challenging to get. Um, if uh, Coloplast, for whatever reason, decides to stop making it, um, you're in trouble. I tend to do Malone's. Uh, a Malone catheter costs, I think, a dollar fifty. A bag costs about, I think, ten dollars, and you can utilize your Malone for probably under, you know, ten fifteen dollars a month for the rest of your life. Paristine sometimes can cost upwards of a thousand dollars a month. Um, I love getting pictures of my kids. We get that all the time. Uh, just real quickly about complex urology. No one talks about it. No one talks about bowel and bladder conversation. It's not polite conversation. Everyone talks about heart surgery. No one talks about mermaids. And I see mermaids. And this is, you know, these are children that deserve an opportunity and a chance at life and all the things that other children are able to, to get. Uh, we talk about cancer. That's a huge aspect of pediatric care but we don't talk about what happens when the bowel, bladder, and the genitals are outside the body. Postoperatively, that's what they look like, but we can't show that in the New York Times. It's not polite conversation. This is about advocating for our children who can't advocate for themselves. I don't believe that diapers are necessarily a choice. And it's also about nutrition. It's not just about being dry. It's about preventing the problems and it's not elective. Let's see here. Um, we follow our children very closely from a nutrition standpoint to make sure they're growing and staying on their curves. Our dietitian is critical in sort of helping us understand that. And sometimes we get these great pictures of this child that I saw when he was a baby. He's now 16. Actually, he's now 20. Um, and uh, he's doing quite well. And uh, he started off life in the one percentile for height and weight. So time and management, uh, I start everybody in infancy. We don't necessarily start intermittent catheterizations, but we do start bowel and bladder management in some fashion really very, very early. Formula fed infants get put on Senna pretty quickly. Breast milk fed infants tend to hold off on any bowel management until transition to other things. And the management of cacket and stage of kidney disease begins in infancy. Quickly, reconstruction, that patient on the right-hand side of the two thumbs up was my reconstruct from Thursday. That was a 14-hour surgery, and that is her seven hours after surgery with two thumbs up. So our anesthesia team has been incredible with pain management and doing well and helping us with our kids. Uh, we usually do the procedures between four and six years of age, and we do all the reconstructions that we can think about. Um, average of our time is about eight and a half hours. That child had some other issues. And it requires a big family commitment in terms of local stay and lifelong follow-up. And obviously pitfalls are when we don't manage them and the kids don't grow and we just have them in diapers. And there's again, consequences for that long-term. So I'm going to stop now because I think we are getting close to time unless you guys want me to go further. We have our moderators on the line. Should I continue or should we stop for questions? We have a couple more minutes for um, some of the questions. And I'm, I apologize because my dog is barking now, but um, we do have a question about, and I've heard it before too with the National Resource Center of the Spina Bifida Association, um, the use of Marilax. It seems that sometimes or oftentimes it's prescribed, but we heard today that it's something you prefer not to use. Yeah, it's, it's really a preference not to use it because it can actually mask constipation because some kids will get uh, massive diarrhea and secretory diarrhea and still be constipated because of the very nature of Miralax. Miralax works really well for idiopathic constipation, but for neurogenic constipation, it can muddy the waters. So that doesn't mean it's to be avoided. 
um, but it is not my go-to. Thank you. And I think that there's one more question. Um, it says, Dr. Alam, please talk a bit more about when ma the MACE procedure can be considered for spina bifida. All right, perfect. So let's go here. So when we do the MACE procedure, I tend to do it with the, the Malone as well. And so, uh, the, the, excuse me, the, the Mitrofenoff. So the MACE procedure or the Malone uh, is an anterograde uh, enema for bowel management. It's um, really done after about four years of age. I tend to do it with the Mitrofenoff because we can split the appendix and make uh, a Malone and a Mitrofenoff from the same appendix. We tend to start all patients before the Malone on enemas from below. Just a, you know, a Malone doesn't really work if enemas from below don't work so well. And uh, there's a lot of kind of work that goes into that to get patients ready for the Malone. Every now and again, we have to remove the sigmoid colon because it becomes very dilated from poor bowel management. And uh, sometimes a Malone won't work. Now, very, very important for everyone to understand. When you are 15 and 16, and you haven't had any bowel management and you have spina bifida and you get a Malone, it's probably not gonna work. Uh, we tend to do the Malones between four and six years of age and we do bowel management aggressively before that. I'm not suggesting every child needs a Malone at six, but they need aggressive bowel management before a Malone. It isn't that one day we decide to manage the constipation with a Malone because we've been on Miralax for a while. That sometimes doesn't result in the outcomes that you would want. And so go-to for constipation. The protocol that we utilize is typically Senna. Uh, I use the uh, Senna, the 8.8 .8 milligrams and five mLs for infants. And as the kids get older, we tend to go straight to X-lax and, and X-lax is just something that I can titrate. It's 15 milligrams per chocolate square. So that kind of helps. And uh, again, I, I do see a question here about um, adults with uh, bowel management and spina bifida. Uh, I want all the adults to, to be out there and, and, and start beating the drum and talking about their, their bowel management and um, sort of where they are at because bowel management is sometimes best to manage when they're children. Um, I have been able to manage adults. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated and it sometimes does require segmental resections of the colon in order to get the enema to work properly. Any other questions? You think you can quickly this last this last one? Um, what is your go-to for constipation? So it's Senna. It's Senna. Oh. Uh, the Senna liquid, the eight point eight milligrams at five uh, for babies, and then to Xlax. That's typically what I do. Okay. Great. Well, I think um, I think we're done. So thank you so much, Dr. Alam, for covering all that information, and for all of those of you who um, still had questions, please stay tuned. We'll have your questions answered um, in a few days. All right, thank you everybody. Thank you.